Well, tell me a little bit about yourself and your work here. Oh, I'm a professor of pharmacology and the director of the Center for Addiction Research, and I'm really excited that you'll be able to work with us today because we have a lot of interesting opportunities to tell you about. Oh, well, great. Yeah, I'm, I want to hear more about your research and meet some of your colleagues. All right, well, great. Good. It's you know, wonderful to be here, and thank you so much for taking the time. Can you tell me a little bit more about who we're talking with today? Sure. Along with me, we have uh, Eric and Noel, and if you'll both take a moment to introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, Chris. I'm Eric Wold, a medicinal chemist in the Center for Addiction Research. Excellent. Nice to meet you. Hi, Chris. I'm no uh, Dr. Noel Anastasio, and I'm an assistant professor in the Center for Addiction Research. Excellent. Yeah, very nice to meet you both. Nice to meet you, too. Yeah, thank you for your time. Well, I guess, uh, so tell me a little bit about just so what is addiction and what are sort of the effects on people who are, are suffering from this? So six in 10 U.S. adults have used licit or illicit drugs in the past month. And just last year, over 20 million people in the United States have been diagnosed with a substance use disorder. That means that chances are someone that you know, someone that you're close to, is fighting addiction themselves or, or has fought it in the past. That could be a son, daughter, mother, father. And, you know, Chris, the reality is that none of these people put addiction as a goal in their yearbook or in their middle school essays about, you know, the future. And addiction doesn't care about goals, um, and it could affect almost any one of us. In these drugs, they seem like they have so much to offer, but give nothing. And they end up taking so much more than almost any of us have to give. Um, and so that's why here in the Center for Addiction Research, we're very focused on understanding the, the biology behind it and also the um, social constructs and uh, wanting to further treatment development. Yeah, so speaking of treatment, so what, what kind of treatments are there out there? And right, yeah, so some of the latest numbers are telling us that, you know, those who need treatment are less than 2% of the population are actually receiving treatment. And what research is telling us is that we know that a combination of cognitive behavioral therapy and when available medications um, can help benefit the most. Um, and so there are some FDA approved medications for, you know, alcohol and nicotine and opioids uh, but no FDA-approved medications exist for cocaine, uh, methamphetamine, or marijuana. And, and so there's, those are barriers, right, for those people with those diseases. And there are other barriers, and the, the first is getting access. And whether that barrier is a geographical, um, economical, or even societal. And, and Chris, what I mean by that is that we've known for many years that addiction is a brain disease. And yet there are still pockets in the community that um, those that suffer from this disease uh, have a large stigma surrounded by it. Um, and that can hinder them seeking treatment or, um, you know, their loved ones helping them out sort of. Um, and so, you know, you mentioned the, the yearbook and one of the things that, you know, drives my passion when I was a student here at UTMB, I participated or worked on a clinical trial. And it's, it's certified in me why I wanted to continue to study the biology of addiction um, to help those people that are suffering from it, was I met a man and he told me, he said, you know, Noel, um, I might have chosen to use cocaine the first time, but I never chose to become an addict. And that really struck um, deep inside of me. And so one of the things that we work on here in the center is, is, is outreach and that if we can go into our communities and using education and conversations, we can start to break down those barriers and really help those that need it to, to get the help they need. So tell me, I guess, what is the latest scientific research and what is it about your work that, that gives you hope considering the numbers and the obstacles? I think, I think Noel prefaced that very well, and I'll just follow that up with what happens when somebody tries to uh, admit that they have an addictive problem to a physician, and the physician doesn't know how to diagnose it and how to treat it. So we have not given the tools to the physicians to, to do that well. And so, Chris, that's one of the main things that we are trying to do. How do we best diagnose the disorder? How do we identify it early enough? 
and how do we maximize the treatment protocols which require behavioral cognitive therapy which allows someone to rethink and reset and that can take years of time. Medications are a really important asset of that and we're not talking about oh let's replace cocaine with another cocaine. These are medications that dampen and help control the urges and the cravings that go along with, uh, with, with the, the drug they seek. And if we can keep that abstinence for three to four to five years, mm -hmm. the probability is that 85, 90 percent of those individuals will not go back to drugs. But think about it, three to five years. You know, keep somebody in treatment a very long time. So I think the beauty about what we're doing now is that we've recognized all these realities. Now we need the right patterns, and they're not the same for everybody. We can't just say, here's this one treatment, this one behavioral treatment, and one medication, and it's going to fix everybody. We have to have all of this information about uh, diagnostics, genetics, epigenetics, cellular aspects, neuroimaging aspects. You put all that together like you do the moonshot for cancer and suddenly you have a picture of how to treat that disorder. We're not even close to that. Our moonshot is now. Uh, well, tell me, I guess, a little bit more than, so what is it you need to kind of get to that moonshot to get to the work so, you need to do? So we, we're, there's so many levels that we that we're working on. We work on a, a, cellular, a molecular level, a cellular level, a whole person level. We do clinical research with humans and imaging. And Eric can give you a really good example of the kind of targeted direction we are going with medications development. Yes, yeah, certainly. So, so Chris, when you think about a, a brain, it just, you know, in a, in a normal functional um, individual, there are so many so many receptors, so many neurotransmitters, so many things happening at any given time. And we see that these things can be altered under, um, un with those people who have a substance use disorder. And it's excitingly, now we're able to take some of these receptors, these, these really important proteins in the brain that interact with neurotransmitters, right? And we're able to look at them in such a finite detail that we can begin to design new molecules that will eventually become our next generation therapeutics. And in a way of designing them that we can adjust these receptors that will actually impact the overall circuitry and, and hopefully, you know, maybe stave off craving and, and keep people in, um, in recovery longer, so. Right, and Eric, you know, to, to, to follow up with that, we've, we've, we've worked on some of these medications and some in people with cocaine use disorder and have shown that they're able to normalize this dysfunctional uh, neurocircuitry that is, is evident in people with this disease. And that can also then normalize and, and decrease their craving. And, and craving is an important aspect. You know, it, it can be triggered by the people, places, and things that the that the individual associated with their with their drug of, of choice. And and if we can tamper that so that those don't trigger the brain and they don't initiate that, you know, both physiological and psychological craving, then like Eric and, and, and Catherine mentioned, we can keep these people in treatment. We can get them to those five years. Now, yes, there might be instances where they, they relapse or they have a recurrence. And instead of saying that treatment failed, what we need to do is we need to reformat that treatment, right? Go after that individual and really get at that individual's, you know, biology and behavior so that we can help them get back on treatment, stay on treatment, and ultimately be a success. Excellent. And tell me, how do you fund this research, I guess? How do you actually go about doing this? About 85% of our effort. <laughs> 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 Just kidding. Uh, the NIH, federal funding agencies, we do seek uh, fun and, and have. We're all funded uh, quite well from NIH. It's the uh, the realm, the coin of the realm, right? Mm -hmm. The problem with uh, NIH funding is it's sometimes you just go right to it and you have it in a year. That's about the quickest you can get it, but uh, it can take two, two and a half years. It's very slow. And we have, we have uh, 
ongoing programs. Eric's, Eric has been doing an incredible job, and we, we have needed the, we've had incredible technology needs. So we've gone out and we've gotten foundation grants, and we've gone out and, and provided any kind of the res anything we can fund uh, so that Eric has his resources. So uh, foundations, uh, companies, uh, individuals, we've had resources, uh, and it, the the faster it goes is really pretty much a baseline of people, the great people that we work with, and the resources that we need from a laboratory perspective, and then the funding for salaries and all the other aspects of it, yeah, so. It's a, it's a constant battle to be tr truthful. <laughs> thanks, Chris, and thanks to the audience for your attention today. Uh, really appreciate the effort of UTMB to allow us to uh, use this lovely room for our talk and Life Insight for supporting all of our work and our video today and all of you for being here. <laughs>